Hello everybody, my name is Sara Bouchard and I'm a storyteller from Toronto, Canada. Thank you to the Toronto Palestine Film Festival um, for inviting me to tell stories, traditional stories. Um, Palestinian traditional stories are really important to me. Um, because it preserves, preserves our tradition, our Palestinian folk art tradition. And um, when a country is occupied, it's especially important to remember our culture. So without further ado, here we go. My grandmother, Sara Abu Sharar, whom I was named after, was a storyteller. She inherited this important role from her mother, who was also a storyteller. My grandmother's mother's family lived in that same village in Hebron Hills for 1,500 years. And before that, they could trace their roots back to Yemen and Egypt. My grandmother's family lived in that village for so long that when my great-grandmother told her stories, she could describe every snake that ever slithered down those hills. And my grandmother's father was somebody, Philistine. The Sumerians were there long before the Arabs and the Jews. They were indigenous to the Hebron Hills. And my grandmother's father was a blind man. And because at that time, not all children went to school, my grandmother stayed behind and she became my great-grandfather's eyes. And once a month, she took my great-grandfather by his hand and she led him along the path towards Hebron City. And my Judith could hardly contain herself because she knew that the last shop that they would enter would be the shop of her two best friends, two little Jewish girls. And because those little, I know it might seem strange to you now that my grandmother, who was Muslim and, and, and Palestinian, would be best friends with two little Jewish girls. But you see, this was 1930 when Palestinian Muslims and Christians and Jews all mingled together. And the only time religion ever came up was during times of holidays and only to wish each other a happy holiday. My father remembers my grandmother painting Easter eggs every Easter. And when my grandmother was about 90 years old, my father asked her, why is it that you paint Easter eggs if you're not Christian? And my Jidity looked at my father and she said, Jesus was born in Bethlehem and so he is Palestinian, which means Easter is not a Christian holiday, but a Palestinian holiday. And she continued to paint those Easter eggs until the day that she died. Now back to my grandmother as the little girl and the two little Jewish girls. Because the two little girls went to school, they knew how to read. And they sat my grandmother down and they read books to her. And even though my grandmother heard stories every day from her mother and her grandmother, these stories were extra special to her because they came from books and they were read to her by her two best friends. And then my grandmother grew and at age 16, she married. And two years later, she gave birth to my father, whom she named Isa, meaning Jesus in Arabic, Abu Sharad. He was born on January 31st, 1948, just a few months before the Nakba. A land, but Britain had given parts of Palestine to Israel, leaving the other parts untouched. A land without a people, for a people 
without a land. A land without a people. But there were people there. My father was there. Palestinians fled in every direction. Most went to neighboring countries like Jordan and Syria and Lebanon. And some went farther to Greece and to Chile. Many went to Chile. And then there were those, perhaps the most unfortunate of all, who walked to the neighboring Palestinian cities and villages. And they became refugees on their own land. Many of those people went to Hebron City. And they did have a refugee camp for them there. But it was so small, so insufficient, so overcrowded, tent upon tent upon tent. And so, in 1952, a very wealthy and yet generous man, Abdul Aziz, donated his best land to these people. And he made a second refugee camp for them, the Al Fawar refugee camp. And around that same time that Al Fawar refugee camp was built, my father had some troubles of his own. His little sister, the one who he played with and later took care of. She died of brain cancer, leaving my father a lonely and sad little boy with nobody to play with. Why, he could either play with children much older than him or little babies. And so he sat by himself all day long. And in the evenings, he saw my great-grandmother sitting underneath the fig tree, building a home made out of stones. And my father was sure that she was playing without him. And so he went and he hid behind that tree. And when my great-grandmother wasn't looking, bang, he knocked down that home. And my great-grandmother, without saying a word, calmly picked up those stones, and she rebuilt her home. And my father walked back to his home, to his large circle of women, storytellers story telling stories around the fire. And my father took some chestnuts and sometimes even potatoes. Oh, then they would really have a party. And he threw them inside of that fire. And he sat beside his mother. He sat and he listened to those stories. Folk tales were his favorite. He listened to every word in hopes that one day he could share those stories with his own children. And the following is one of those stories that my father would have heard in that circle of women. There was once a Bedouin named Emir Hamid. He was so wealthy. He had so much cattle and so much gold. But his heart was spacious and his hands always open to all who came his way. Any time anybody came through those rugged mountains, Emir Hamid welcomed them inside. And he not only gave them hospitality, but he gave them food and water. So liberal was his generosity that there came a day when Emir Hamid had nothing left. Nothing but one she-camel. And that was around the same time 
when the Sultan was getting ready to journey across his lands. He disguised himself as a traveling dervish, took his minister with him, and they journeyed through the mountains and into the desert and back into the mountains again until they found themselves next to the tent belonging to Emir Hamid. Ahlan! Emir Hamid welcomed them inside and he sat them down on brightly colored sequined mats. And then he went to the other side of the tent, the side where the women sat. And he asked his wife if she could make some food for their guests. But I can't make any food for our guests. We have nothing left, nothing left to give. He asked her if she may go to the neighbor's tent to borrow some flour just enough so that he could at least make some bread for their guests. She walked to the neighbor's tent. He belonged to a poor woman. I have nothing to give you. Let him who wants to show off his hospitality to his guests serve his guests with the meat of his last she-camel. And the wife walked back to the tent, and she told her husband what it is that the poor woman had said. And he immediately took his sword, and he swung it towards the head of that camel when the sultan cried, Allah! Hajla! That's the camel that carries your tent when you travel. No, that's not the camel that carries my tent when I travel. This is the camel that feeds my guests. Allah will give me another camel. And with that, he did that which the poor woman had suggested. And the wife took that camel and she cut it up into bits and she cooked it until the meat was so soft and tender. And then she put it on a large tray and she served the food to her guests. And the guests began to eat. And while they feasted, the Bedouin and the Sultan, disguised as a traveling dervish, shared travel stories. They shared those stories until their bellies were bursting with camel meat. And then the wife took the remainder of that meat and she carried it to the poor woman's tent. And then the next tent, and the next tent, and the next tent. Until all the Bedouins on that mountain were fed and well. And then she walked back towards her tent. And as she was approaching that tent, she heard the Sultan say something to the Bedouin. On Friday at noon, come to the mosque for the noon prayers. The Sultan will be there. He will have another she-camel for you. And with that, he left. And the Bedouin waited. He waited until Friday. And then he took his cane and he walked towards that mosque. And when he arrived inside of the mosque, he turned to someone beside him and he asked, Which one is the Sultan? That man over there kneeling, he's our Sultan. He's praying. He's praying for blessings. And he looked over at the man, the Sultan, but he could not recognize him for the sultan's forehead was kissing the ground and his hands were outstretched in prayer and upon every finger was a golden shining ring and from behind him was a large red velvet cloak. He could not recognize him. 
No, the Sultan is not praying for blessings. The Sultan is praying for another she-camel to give to me. But I can ask Allah for the same. And he left that mosque. And he walked and he walked and he walked until he reached the top of that mountain. And then he took off his cloak and he placed it on the ground facing the direction of Mecca. And he began to pray. Allah, that which the Sultan is praying for, please give that to me also. Give that to me also. And then he took his cane and he leaned upon it to rise up his body. But the cane had sunk to the ground. He wiggled it, and beneath that cane, underneath, he could feel a hard surface. He unbrushed the soil from underneath that cane, and there was a large, large opening. It was like a door. He opened up that door, and there was a gigantic staircase. He took his cane, and he began to walk down those stairs when he noticed a light shining on the stairs. He looked up. It was coming from up and shining through the door onto the stairs. He followed that light, and with each step, the light got brighter and brighter and brighter until it was shining against seven large clay pots filled, overflowing with gold. He immediately took that goatskin tent, he placed it upon his newfound treasures, and now he was even wealthier than before why he could afford one of every kind of animal. And there were so many animals that the sun could not even reach the earth from beneath them. And the inside of his tent he decorated with the finest of silks and velvets and carpets, 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 oh, the carpets. And what of the sultan? The sultan began to wonder and ask his minister, Whatever happened to that generous, generous Bedouin, you know, the one who, uh, who slaughtered his last she-camel in our honor? He never did come and claim his camel. Let us go and seek him out. And once again, the sultan disguised himself as a traveling dervish. He took his minister with him, and they traveled through the mountains and into the desert and back into the mountains again until they found themselves in that same spot they were before. Only there were so many animals that their shadows moved like the shadow of the clouds upon the land. The sultan turned to a a shepherd. To whom do all of these camels belong? They belong to Emir Hamid. And to whom do all of these goats belong? They belong to Emir Hamid. And the, and the horses, Emir Hamid, and the sheep, Emir Hamid, Emir Hamid, Emir Hamid, Emir Hamid. Emir Hamid. But I was just in Emir Hamid's tent not long ago, and he had nothing, nothing but one she-camel. Where did he acquire all this wealth? I will go, and I will ask my friend myself. And he took his minister, and they walked towards where that tent was before. 
Only this wasn't the same tent as before. No, this tent was held up by golden poles and silver poles and copper poles. And the Bedouin brushed aside the black velvet curtain. Ahlen! He welcomed them inside. And oh, the tent was spectacular. On the ground were yellow silk mattresses from Damascus. And from the ceiling hung purple lantern from Jerusalem and carpets. There were carpets from Egypt and Turkey and Persia and even from Azerbaijan. And the wife brought a large tray filled with food and she served it to her guests. And once again, they began to feast. And while they ate, the sultan and uh, the one disguised as a traveling dervish and the Bedouin shared travel stories. They shared those stories until butter dripped from their fingers. And then the sultan looked at the Bedouin and he asked, Where did you acquire all this wealth? And the Bedouin told him the story. He told him the story from beginning until the end. And then he said, Well, I see that the moon has risen up. I see that it's time for us to go to sleep. And he walked the sultan and the minister to their beds. And then he went to his own bed with his wife. And as soon as the Bedouin left, the minister leaned over towards the sultan and he whispered something from his neck. You, the ruler of our time, do not possess seven large pots filled overflowing with gold. You must behead him. If you don't behead him, he's going to hire his men and he's going to take over all your lands. I can't. I can't do that. How could I do harm to somebody who gave me so much generosity? This is what you do. You just go to sleep. In the morning when you're having your tea with the Bedouin, you tell him that you had a terrible dream. And in that dream, you heard a voice and it said, Oh, oh, oh. Mm, whatever could that mean? And of course, it's going to say to you, only dogs say, ow, ow, ow. And calling you the Sultan a dog is reason enough for you to behead him. And with that, the minister went to sleep. And he did sleep. But the Sultan, he could not sleep that night. He tossed, and he turned, and he tossed, and he turned. But in the morning, he did go to tea with the Bedouin. I had a terrible dream last night. I dreamt that somebody was saying, ow, ow, ow. Whatever could that mean? And the Bedouin smiled, a knowing smile. And then he shook his head and he broke his silence and he spoke. The first owl is the owl in dull, light in Arabic, in your waking wish. May Allah bless anybody who disperses darkness and brings forth light. The second owl is the owl in Jaw, air in Arabic, and your dreaming wish. May Allah bless anybody who gives the bird its wings and watches it fly into freedom. The third owl 
is the Au in Zau, evil in Arabic, in your just wish. May Allah curse anybody who wishes evil upon another. And with that, the Bedouin hung his head so humble and he waited. And the Sultan took his sword and he swung the sword towards the Bedouin. But the sword did not reach the head of the Bedouin, but rather he continued towards the head of the minister. And the Sultan revealed himself as who he is, a Sultan. And he made the Bedouin his minister. And from that day on, the Bedouin was always by the Sultan's side, advising him and teaching him on how to bring light and flight to his people. And my father listened to those stories. He listened to every word. Fairy tales were his favorite. He listened to every word in hopes that one day he could share those stories with his own children. But my father never told us fairy tales. He stopped believing in magic. He told us real life stories that, like fairy tales, contained kings, brave young men, and monsters. He didn't share those stories much, but when he did, he paused frequently to stop his tears from falling. See that mountain over there, Sada? When I was a child, there was a helicopter parked on that mountain every day. Every day they watched us. They watched us as we ate. And they didn't pause to stop watching us as we played. It was as if that helicopter was part of that mountain. Times were different then. My father's stories always began this way. And in the end, my brother and I wonder how different they really were. And maybe times did not change so much from that time long, 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 long ago when my folktale of the Bedouin was first told in Palestine and in the Arab world. And perhaps, perhaps that message inside of that story, the message inside of all traditional stories, perhaps if we listen to that message, not just listen, but hear them, perhaps if we listen to the Bedouin's words, encouraging us to bring light, flight, freedom to our people. Palestine will be free. Kashmir would be free. Turtle Island would be free. And until then, this reality is all we have. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much to the Palestine Film Festival. In September, the Palestine Film Festival will air again. And um, they have gone through a lot of cuts because of COVID. They lost a lot of funding. So if you're looking for an arts organization uh, to donate to, please donate generously, as generously as the Bedouin would have, in the story, would have donated to the Palestine Film Festival. Thank you so much. Goodbye. For all of you, all of you that are celebrating Ramadan, Ramadan Karim, for all of you that are not, please stay safe.